In the past week, I have been reading in an interesting paper published by Robert Jones in Review of Modern Physics. And it was about the past, the present, and the future of density functional theory. And one of the first graphs in this paper was this one, a type of graph you have surely seen before, that shows the number of DFT-related publications per year as a function of time. No surprise, but I was struck by the absolute numbers. If you look at this, 15,000 publications per year. Now, here in this conference, we are with what I would call the core community of the DFT community, about 1,000 people. I don't think that each of us is publishing 15 unique papers per year. We would like to, but we surely don't. So that indicates, that number indicates that density functional theory has spread far outside its core community. It has become a kind of commodity product that researchers also in other fields use to solve their problems. They go to their scientific supermarket, take DFT from the shelf, and apply it to their problem. Now, what makes a commodity product really a commodity product? It's one special feature. People trust com commodity products. If you go to your normal supermarket and you buy apples, then you trust that these will be healthy for you, that the level of pesticides will be low, that there will not be any bacterial contamination. And why do you trust these apples in your supermarket? Because the whole supply chain is certified. The producer of these apples has been certified, the transporter has been certified, the supermarket itself has been certified. Is the same true about our density functional theory tools? To what extent have these been certified to enable trust in these tools? Well, let me try to put myself in the position of a skeptical outsider that wants to decide, should I use DFT? And if I use it, which particular incarnation of DFT will I use? If I'm a really skeptical outsider, I will probably go to the literature. I will take some innocent material. Let's examine silicon. I will take an innocent property, the lattice parameter of silicon, and I will take an off-the-shelf DFT version in the purdue burke ernzerhof functional, and let's see what the core community has produced about this property, this material, with this flavor of DFT in the literature. And that's the kind of data you will find. Lattice parameter of silicon as a function of time in the published literature. That shows me, as a skeptical outsider, that these DFT people have an issue about precision of their methods. They don't all produce exactly the same lattice parameter. The, 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 the spread is small, but, well, this was an easy problem. So if there is such a spread on an easy case, what could happen for more complicated cases? There is also an issue about accuracy. If I compare any of these predictions with experiments, I will see some differences. So as a skeptical outsider, I go to the DFT community and I ask these people, can you explain me what is happening there? And they will tell you, well, this problem of accuracy, that's due to the limitations of our exchange correlation functional. And we have examined many cases. We know that the difference will not be large and so on and so on. And the spread about all these different data points, well, we use different codes, we use different numerical methods, and we have examined all these differences and that we trust the method. It's, it's okay, you can be safe. Now, the skeptical outsider will say, you trust these methods, well, in God we trust, but all the others should show data. So show me the numbers, point me to the publications where you have examined all these things. And then you run into a problem, because there aren't too many of such publications available. There is some work about the accuracy issue, but the precision issue, examining how much different DFT codes differ in their predictions, that is not systematically examined. 
And that is exactly the thing we try to do with a team of 69 people taken from across the DFT community that all are experts on one particular DFT code or method. And we sit together and try to examine the differences between all these codes and implementations. How do we do that? Well, we decide about a common test set. And our test set was this one. We take 71 elements from the periodic table and take these elements in their experimental elemental ground state structure. So magnesium, that would be an HCP crystal, iron would be a BCC crystal, and so on for each of these 71 elements. For each of these crystals, we agree on some reference volume that has no particular uh, physical significance, just a volume that is not too far away from the, the ground state uh, volume. Then we take seven volumes in total, spread from minus 6% to plus 6% around this reference volume, and each of us takes their favorite tool and calculate total energies for all of these 71 elements for these volumes. So for one crystal, you get a set of energy data points like this. We fit a birch mordigan equation through that. And I do this with one code. Someone else does that with another code. We put these two cases together and inspect the differences. How do we express the difference? Well, we look at the area difference between these two birch mordigan curves and express this as a root mean square value. And that number, that difference, we call delta for these two codes and that particular crystal. You will easily see that if, if the two codes would predict exactly the same curves, then this value will be zero. The larger it is, the larger the deviation. So this is a specific example, FCC copper at the left hand side done with the exciting code, at the right hand side with the FLUOR code. The delta for exciting and FLUOR for FCC copper is 0.8 milli electron volts per atom. You do that not only for FCC copper, but for all of these 71 crystals, and you take the average over all of these values, And in that way, that, that number for exciting and FLUOR is 0.5 milli electron volts per atom. In that way, you express in one single number a kind of deviation between these two codes. If you do that not once, but for 40 different combinations of methods and codes, you get this matrix, where, which, is, which expresses all these pairwise delta values. It's color-coded such that green is small and red is large, yellow is intermediate. So don't try to read this. We will zoom in on a few sections and comment on these. So this is the section where we compare seven all-electron methods with each other. And you see that everything is green and yellow here. There is not any of these pairs that has a delta value that is larger than one milli electron volt per atom. That number doesn't probably tell you much, but if you translate this to observable properties for a typical crystal, you get values like this. This is a spread of 0.01 angstrom in the lattice parameter and one gigapascal in the bulk modulus. And Each of us can probably agree that this is a very small spread. That's the kind of spread you have between all electron methods. Let's compare now all electron methods with PAW codes. So the bottom block is different PAW codes with their projector sets compared to the upper block compared to the all electron methods. The number that matters is The number here at the right hand side, that's the average of all these deltas, so all comparisons with all, all electron codes. And also here you see that the number is similarly low. The modern incarnations of the PAW methods have as few deviations from all electron methods as the internal deviations among all electron methods. So they are intrinsically identical. Same story for ultra-soft pseudopotentials. 
Here there are five ultra-soft pseudo-potential combinations compared to the all-electron methods. And again, the numbers are small, except if you go to a somewhat older implementation, an older set where the deviation is clearly larger. And exactly the same for the norm-conserving pseudo-potentials. Everywhere, small numbers, except if you take a very old pseudo-potential set. I said a few times, if you go back into history, if you take an old set, well, that's even really true. That's systematically true. If you take over time, what was the delta value compared to the current all-electron values for a set of codes that uses pseudo-potential or PAW libraries that change over time, then you see a systematic improvement. I take, for, for instance, the CASTEP code, which uses three different generations of pseudo-potentials from 98 to 2015, and you see that this gradually improves. So it is true that all these methods agree within narrow ranges, but that is only true since recently. Ten years ago, that wasn't the case. Ten years ago, our skeptical outsider would have had reasons to worry. Nowadays, all good methods produce identical results. The total of number of calculations we used to come to this conclusion is this number, 18,000 and something. And thanks to this set, we can say that density functional theory as an off-the-shelf method here with the PBE functional has become quality certified. So we could show this graph now to our skeptical outsider and say the range of values we have in this well-controlled set is everything within that error bar. So that is really the, num the PBE prediction you can trust. The special feature, I mentioned it already, is that we needed this expert input of many people. So it's appropriate here to thank a few of these people. In the first place, well, you will see all people here on this list. That is the paper we are currently, which is under evaluation about this. It almost looked like elementary particle physics. It's a seven-page digest, more or less with the story I just told you, and 169 pages of supplementary material with all the input and output and result data of all these 40 comparisons. The person who deserves really a lot of credit for this work is Kurt Lejagere, who is in the room here. He has, con he has done a lot of work for this, contributed a lot of ideas. And he has a poster tomorrow where he will explain what is the future, what are the future possibilities in this work. But it's not only Kurt, it's also our 69 other co-authors. And I'm actually wondering how many of these are in the room. Can you please stand up? I have no idea how many there are, but there should be a few of them. That's great, widely dispersed over the room. So while entering the questioning session, I would say, just come to the stage. It's your work as well. So be here with me, all of you. And if there is somebody who wants to take a picture out of that and email it to me, I would be very happy. So everybody of our 69 list on the stage, and I'm ready to take your questions.